really hope you like this video. Just subscribe, like, and click the bell to be notified of more content just like this. Do you know what? And I'm, I'm going to I'm going to kick off with we've got we've got things in common here. Oh yeah. Okay. Go ahead. See why? Because the Red Sox. Yeah. Owned by John Henry. Who owns my football club? Well, not my football club. Who owns Liverpool Football Club? That's right, Liverpool. Yes. So that's that. There's the there's the first thing. The second one is, I interviewed Paul Feig last week. Oh. So there's yes. there's one. Lucky and you. Then, then, I was watching you in in, in Foss, Verdon, just before. Mm -hmm. Eric Roberts, who said. Bob Foss saved his career, stroke him. Wow, and that's a lot of stuff lining up here. A lot that's of amazing. stuff. That's now, amazing. Has, has John Henry, I know very little, um, I'm such a, um, an ugly American, I know very little about um, football culture in Europe. Has Liverpool won the Champions League? Yeah, Liverpool, since John Henry's taken over, I mean, they have, they have a mercurial manager called Jurgen Klopp, who's a German. And Liverpool, since John Henry has been in charge, have, have they won the Champions League, the World Club Cup. And what all Liverpool, a bit like the Sox, what, what all Liverpool fans wanted more than anything else is our domestic Premier League, which they won last year. So it, it, it's, just been, it's just been success after success. I did a play about 10 years ago with a Brit, um, this guy Crispin Wattel, who's a brilliant uh, British playwright, um, Cambridge guy, and he, we were talking, he's a big uh, football and cricket fan, yeah. and he said, and I was like, I want a team, I, I can't identify, I, I feel like I'm supposed to hate Man U, because they're sort of like the Yankees, yeah. and I hate the Yankees, I hate, the, I hate um, teams with too much success. And he's like, you should, you should go for Liverpool. Liverpool would be your team. Yeah, brilliant. I said, okay, all right. But I have gone to one game. I was in London a couple years ago with a buddy, and I went to a Spurs game. Yeah. And it was great. It was the old stadium. It was, it was a wild experience. As a devoted sports fan, I wanted to see what it was like to go to a game. And, and it was incredible. There's nothing like it here in the States. Um, the passion, the focus. I, everyone around me... They didn't, there was no casual conversation. There was no drinking or eating some nachos and just like enjoying the outdoors. It was the game. Mm. The entire focus was on the guys, on the pitch, and that was it. And American sports, there's a, it's about the game, but it's also about the party, the celebration, like being with your pals or whatever. And we got there five minutes late and the two dudes next to us were like, where the fuck have you been? The game started five minutes ago. What do you think this is? Yeah. You here to have fun? Hey, I'm from LA. It's my first game. Give me a break. Ex exactly. We got a lot of shit for being from LA, but uh, it's a culture I want to get into. But the games start so early here, and I like to sleep in. Listen, I just we will talk about your career in a minute, but I, I'm fascinated because a, a bit like you with with football over here. I, I I I'm a cricket. I'm a football cricket. That's what I I'm really. I'm a, I'm a sports TV person. Is what I, I have been most yeah. of my life. And I watched baseball with a fascination. And I was, lucky <laughs> enough, I was lucky enough to go to Fenway Park. I saw them against the Cleveland Indians, as it was, going way back. And mm -hmm. I went twice. Now, I watched, and my, my son plays cricket over here. He he's, wants to be a professional cricketer. So we, we cricket. I watched baseball with an unbelievable fascination, but I don't understand it, if you know what I mean. And I, I saw one of the things you did, and it's, it's the rhythm of the game. It's the minutiae. It's the history. You, you are a proper... You'd be called a badger over here, somebody who's just dedicated to the game, you know? I have a couple of hobbies in my adult life, and the one that I probably devote the most time and effort to is, is, is sports. I love following sports. And uh, I worked um, in New Zealand and Australia in the past 12, 13 years, and so I watched some cricket on TV at, at, at pubs, and I couldn't, I couldn't follow it. I couldn't yeah. follow the runs and the back and forth. But I understand your confusion with baseball because baseball is it. Um, if you, you know, if you're not born into it and grow up watching it every day, um, it takes some time. But the, the magic to me, and I think this is similar in cricket, is there. Uh, there's no clock. Um, yeah. Every other sport, the clock is an opponent. 
you're fighting time. Not only you're fighting your opponent, you're fighting the the, the seconds. So baseball is the the uh, symmetry of baseball too. There's a lot of threes and nines. Everyone gets an even chance at accomplishing the goal. There are these four bases: home, first, second, third. If you divide in, in perfectly in half the outfield, everything is the same. Um, yeah, there's there the, the, in the parks, you know, a basketball court, a soccer pitch, um, a football field. They're all the same. The seats around it may look different, but every field is the same. In baseball, you have different dimensions. There's more personalities, more history to each park, and you you chose the right park to go to in Fenway. Fenway is a is just um, it's a cathedral to baseball. La la sorry, last one for you on sport. What's happening? Are the Patriots? Are they? Are they? I mean, we're, we're massive fans here of the of, yeah. of the. NFL and it's it's gone it's gone so big here um yeah. but I watched Julian Edelman at the weekend and I, I wanted I, he looked like he needed a cuddle from his mom he looked that fed up you know what I mean well the the guy he usually gets a cuddle from is uh playing in in Tampa Bay now so he I feel like he's yeah it's I think it's been a tough time for him he's trying to adjust to a new quarterback and and that team um uh you know Tom Brady was the you know, the face and the quarterback executes everything, right? So if you have a successful quarterback, the team's going to be competent. So when he left and he knew, he knew the system, he knew the coach's system. He's been running that system for 20 years. He could go into any play at any time in any game, playoff game, preseason game, week six, whatever, against any team, any opponent, and anticipate the call from the coach. He knew the play. He knew the player. Um, so there's a shorthand that you can only gain with time and experience. So he's gone. We have a new guy. and uh, But I think it's going to be, we had 20 years Amazing. of success. Yeah. So I'm, I'm good. I'm yeah. good for a while. <laughs> Listen, um, uh, COVID aside, it, f f from my untrained eye, you look like you've been busy. You, you sort of banged out a couple of shows, uh, films, uh, series, you know. You, you seem to be the, like almost like the, the go-to man, as it were, at the moment. Would that be fair? Well, uh, I got really lucky before the pandemic. Yeah, I worked a lot last year, and I worked up until... Uh, actually, my last day of shooting on a series was supposed to be March 13th, which was the day that um, America began to shut down. So that got pushed until... I finally shot it in August in a mask, you know, distanced, everything else. Um, but I got really lucky in the, in the past year to sort of... Um, put a bunch of episodes of television together, gather some cash and put that away. So I'm surviving. And yeah. I've kind of come to the assumption that I won't be back at it until the spring. If I'm lucky, the spring. Um, I've had a few auditions here and there. Things are slowly starting to begin again, but I'm not counting on it. Because um, every opportunity now, because there's so few and everyone's out of work, everyone's dying to get back at it. So you now have people who are tend to live in the film world competing for TV gigs. So oh. the competition is now a little bit a little more dicey. We're like, wait a minute, who's going on for this part? Oh, Jesus, that guy, you know, has been nominated for an Oscar. I'm screwed. Um, but before the shutdown, I was on a nice little roll and I got really, really lucky. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that to have happened last year into, into this past winter. And if, you, if you're on a roll in, in your business, a bit like mine as well, I, I guess more people want you. Yeah, it's um, it's a, it's an industry. Well, you know this. It's an industry of perception, and if you're perceived, doesn't matter if you are or not. If you are perceived to be, if you're perceived to fit into a square that a producer needs, you will you will get that job. But the harder you have to convince a producer, a casting person, a director that you fit in that hole, um, the harder it's going to be for you. So the more you, know, the more you work, the, the, the bigger the resume gets, especially when it's recent, you have proof. You have proof for them to go, oh, I can trust that guy. He's done 10 episodes of a whatever. Oh, he's worked with that director. Uh, oh, he's he done two movies with Paul Feig. Okay, he can handle this comedic stuff. So you have to make it as easy as possible for those people to pull the trigger on you. But um, yeah, it's it's a strange, it's been, and you know, you have good years and you have really down years and you just, I've signed up to ride this roller coaster, um, which is infuriating and 
joyful and depressing, you know, as you know, the ups and downs of this life are, um, you sign up for it. So um, this is part of, you know, part of the gig. And whenever I see you or sing you interviewed, you always sound very upbeat. Are, are you a worrier? Do you, do, do, you go home, <laughs> do you go home and worry like the rest of us? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm great at worrying. I was talking to my mother last week and she was talking to me about her mother. And she said her mother, if she wasn't worried, she'd find she'd come up with something to worry about. So as I've gotten older, I've gotten trying to, you know, find better coping mechanisms, coping strategies, better self-care techniques. Because in my 20s and early 30s, I would, just the slightest thing would show up. I would be like, for, for example, um, trying, to find a, trying to get a gig. I'm in a waiting room and the three guys who are sitting around me in this waiting room are all like, they have jaws and you know, they're like uh, symmetrical faces. And I'm like, oh fuck. And then I'll spend the next three days tearing myself down because I look, you know, like a um, Irish potato and I have this like swollen face and, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm screwed. I'm screwed. And then I'll like, you know, get really good at making myself feel terrible. And the older I've got, the more I realize that this is not a sustainable uh, thought process. So I need, I need to, you know, start taking care of myself. So um, it started with self-medication and that, that wasn't helping either. So then we found therapy and meditation, and those are the practices that are working. And a partner, I have a wonderful fiance who is very helpful in guiding me through those bumpy spots. But you asked me if I'm a warrior, without a doubt, without a doubt. I, re I read early on that you don't read your reviews. I, I mean, you, you're too big now, you can't avoid them. You can't, you can't. <laughs> You can't, you can't avoid, and I also saw fa absolutely fascinating, I've, I've written so much stuff down. I saw when Harry's Law um, was was cancelled, would you say, or not yeah. recommissioned, a really powerful piece you did. I don't know whether you just got the news, literally it was on, and it was like, this, you know, this, we, we were eight million, we've done this, and you, you ended up saying we're just almost like the meat, meat between two advert sandwiches, that's all we do, we're a buffer, which I, I don't know whether you, you meant it at the time, but it certainly looked like it came from the heart. Yeah, the, I mean, the older I get, the more I realize that this is, you know, my dad taught me this lesson when I was really young, and it reverberates to me on a daily basis. He said, you know, it always comes down to the almighty dollar, every decision every single decision it's about Badly. that's it and and you sort of have to play by those rules or or you can say you know what i'm not going to play by those rules i'm just going to produce my own films plays you know in the basements of churches and you know maybe 13 people will show up i'll be true to the, the kinds of stories i want to tell and i'm not going to be committed to any kind of um capitalist you know um paradigm and that's great, and people are doing that. But if you want to um, have a wider voice and reach a bigger audience and make an impact, which is every artist's dream, that's the ultimate dream, to make an impact, to make someone feel something so they have, so their thought processes change. And when you start going higher up the ladder and there's more dollars involved, then the power to change becomes compromised. Um, so you have to negotiate and live with that compromise. And I wasn't willing to live with it in that moment. When we were on a great show that was really humming, we had a lot of viewers, um, but the viewers weren't young enough. That was the problem. They couldn't sell. Um, it's really important for them to sell, to get between 18 and 25, to, to convince those viewers to buy Coke over Pepsi, Mercedes Benz over, you know, Audi, whatever it is. Um, they're not so interested in over 45 because they assume those people have already made up the, their decisions on what they want to consume. It's, 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 it's very much reflective of what's happening over here at the moment. You get on a role like Harry's Law, though, as a character, and you do so many episodes. Um, I, I, I read and I listened to you saying, you know, a lot of the time you, you're conditioned by the writer because the writer probably knows better than you as, a, as an actor. But something like that must be good because you you must be able to play with the character a little bit more as opposed to just come in and do a, you know, a one, a one episode gig or something like that. That, that must have been the real pain of it because you think, I'm really, I'm really getting into my stride here. Completely. And you start to have a dialogue with the writers, like not on a literal back and forth, but they, they, you know, they're watching your work, they're cutting it together, they're seeing, they, they begin to anticipate where your strengths and your weaknesses are. So by episode 12, they're like, oh, we got to write this. He loves this world. Let's write to this. 
And you know, when you come in and do one ep one episode, it's also just a comfort level thing. You're coming in, you don't know anyone. You're there for three days. The first day is spent just like learning people's names and trying not to fuck, you know, screw it up. Part of my French. And um, and as you you know, when when you get comfortable in there every day, it becomes a workplace. It becomes like any other job. And it's a family. And that that more than any other series regular job I had was this one, it was just a wonderful work environment. I loved going to work. And that's, you can't say that about every job as, as you know, um, yeah. you don't get to pick the people around you. Um, if you get lucky, you take one friend from each job. I've, I've sort of realized that, but this, I took a lot of friends from this job because it was such a great environment. So I, I think I was more pissed about losing that family more than anything. I, I, you, you sort of Google Nate Caudry and it says hot geek. Are you happy? <laughs> Tell it, yeah, I'm telling you. I'm thinking, I'll tell you, I'll chuck that one into him. I'm like, mm. I'm, I'm happy with that. I mean, mm. people come on my show because I used to make everybody look good looking, you know, next to me. So <laughs> I'm thinking, hot, hot. In fact, there was, there, was one, there was one website that said, Rob, Rob McCaffrey, people do you fancy that you shouldn't do? That was about me. And I thought, oh. I'm taking that. I'll have. Yeah, going, that's good. So hot, so hot geek, hot geeks looking wow. good. I'm telling you. Wow. All right, I'll look, and I'll take, I'll take any and all of it. Usually, I'm the guy who stands next to, I'm the beautiful guy's buddy who's got like a wisecrack here and there. That's sort of my world. Um, that's where I'm most comfortable because then I make him look or her look even better because I'm a like you know again I look like a swollen potato. Um, but I'll take it, Rob. I will take it. I'll take any piece of compliment. But I, I just wonder then, when you play somebody like Neil Simon, um, or, or, or even even uh, in Mindhunter as well, it was Art Spencer, wasn't it? I can see you as that. I, I can see them go. Tell you what, we need. We need. Let's get Nate. Um, yeah, I got really lucky with both of those jobs. I got really, really lucky, and I think the more, you know, I. You sort of have to build, you, you like, you make fans. The more jobs that you do, you like, you add a couple more people going, oh, what's this guy's name? Oh, he's all right, okay. Yeah, I can see him in something. The more work you do, the more people you add to your, you know. You're hot, mate. I'm telling you you're hot. You're really hot, I'm telling you. <laughs> Man. You can, see, you can see it, you can, you can see it the way that the, the, the roles, you can see the different characters. I, you know, it's it's different kind of stuff you've been asked to play, which which is a compliment to you, surely. That's the thing that I'm most I think proud of more than anything is that I, I can, I think I can live in both worlds. I can spend time, you know, improvising on a Paul Feig set with wonderful comedians, but I also really like um, the depth and richness that comes with playing sort of heavier, more serious kind of character-driven drama. I I love that world, and so. I think it helps me because I float in both of those worlds and I can, I'm competent in both, but I think it also is a challenge too because certain people see me and go, what is he? Is he, is he like a, you know, does he only do dramatic stuff or, or is he like a comedy guy? I can't quite, because there are other actors who are in the same age, same type, same look, same level of experience who fit exactly in that. Their peg goes right in the hole. That's a half hour sitcom guy. This is a, you know, prestige drama guy I, that's easy i know it but with me they have to it takes a second to be like is this does this fit so i think i have more opportunity because i float in both worlds but i don't fit exactly into either one so it's a it's a you know it's all a blessing but i think it may it may hurt me as well but this, well I, I i was going to say that the, i guess now the key is okay covid behind if we, we don't covid we, we, we we're all vaccinated and everybody's happy I guess for you now, the key is to pick the right one. Is to, is I don't I don't know how you do it. I don't know what the the, the secret is. Maybe not. Hey, listen, if somebody offers you ten million dollars to go back to a sitcom, you do it. But if there's if you can do that, but also find a find a role that pushes you. Find a role that people go, hey, there he is. There's Nate doing that. That must be that must be key now. I reckon. You know, if I was really smart, I would create my own vehicle and I would build it exactly to my you know specifications and have the perfect you know hour-long tv series that i could star and then i know that i would knock out of the park i don't have that skill my fiance has that skill she's an actor and a writer and i'm not able to create that sort of world i don't have that skill 
So you're left to wait for the town to knock on your door and give you an opportunity. That's, that's where it sort of is out of your hands. You don't get to, unless you're creating your own stuff, decide what's next. The town decides what's next for you. And you may have a couple of choices to pick from if you're really, really lucky. Um, but usually it depends on what's coming down the pike. And man, is this, my, is this what I'm going to spend the next three years of my life on? What about this amazing play? I would, can I spend six months in New York and lose money but do this incredible part and in incredible play? You know, you have to sort of weigh that balance. And as I get older, and as you know, like responsibilities add up. And so those yeah, just, choices. Oh, yeah, that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, how difficult is it when you go into, say, a film? I saw a, a scene you did in Circle where, you know, for, for people who, you know, all, all, all film buffs, I guess you learn your lines, but are you, is it like, or do they gently put you in, or, or do they go, off you go, Nate, there you go, don't mess it up, bang. Uh, one of the biggest um, learning curves is when you do your first film or your first TV gig, because most people come up through the theater, so you have three weeks. You know, you get to make mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake, and then you slowly find your way, and then you make more mistakes, and then you find it, and then you're in front of an audience. So in a film or a television show, you just show up that day, you have one rehearsal, and it's less about you and more about the camera. They assume that you've done your work. You did the work when you prepared for the audition and got the job. They saw a finished product there. So you have to recreate that performance. And of course, that's all thrown up in the air when you're opposite another actor and they're giving you different energy. And so you have to negotiate that energy and you're listening and taking in all the stimulus from the scene, the words and the sounds and the lights and everything else. So uh, you have to really be quick on your feet. And also you have to be very confident that this is enough. You're so used to having three weeks to experiment. There's no experimentation because of dollars. They have amount of time to shoot this scene. We got three hours to shoot this scene and they're moving on to something else. So you got to get it right because of, you know, the person who's paying the bills. So it's a learning curve, but now, you know, I've been in the business for a while now. So like a movie like The Circle, I knew the director a little bit. We had a friend in common and I've actually been in a poker game with him a couple of times and he's a lovely guy. And I think that was one of the reasons why I got the part because he was familiar with me as a, as a person in, in our buddy's backyard playing poker. Um, so we had a shorthand. Um, and it was really easy that he's in, he was a loving, very generous, sweet guy. And we did a bunch of takes, but he was only kind. And just the adjustments that he made were, were small. And I, we worked in the audition when we, when I had the call back with him, he worked for, you know, 20 minutes and, and he was like, okay, he, he's going to, he's going to be fine. You know, the day we shoot this scene, but it's a steep learning curve. The first time you show up, cause you have no, there is no rehearsal. You kind of shoot the rehearsal. Do you get starstruck? Yeah, you, it's rare, but usually, um, usually it's more with musicians or athletes. It's less with performers mm -hmm. yeah. because, because I know the life of a performer. And so like the magic is sort of taken away from, because I, I'll be, I'll be working on a show and I'll see that Human, person. Said, What's that? It's only Bill Murray. It's only Paul Newman kind of thing. <laughs> well, the, yeah. In those moments, yeah. Yeah, because for, for me, of all those comedians, like Bill Murray is my favorite. And I have a sad Bill Murray story because I love Bill Murray way more than Chevy Chase or Belushi or Aykroyd, any of those guys. It was always, it was always Bill Murray for me. And we were shooting that scene and it was getting late and the time was running out. And we had to get our day by 7 p.m. And we had this one scene where we were down in the basement of this bank and we had to shoot through the bars of a, of a bank vault. And I had to walk in and hit my mark and say the lines to him. And I couldn't. The mark, the shot was really, really tight because they were shooting through these bars. And so they had to get my eyes and his eyes. And if I was off just by a, set, a half inch, it didn't work. I did it three times and I was off just by this much and it didn't work. And he came over to me and I was like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And he's like, listen, so do you see that X on the ground? So you have to, you know, stand on that. And I was like, oh my God, this guy thinks I've never done a fucking movie before. I was so, I blew it. I blew it with Bill Murray and I'll never get that chance again. So I, I, I um, that, that killed me. But starstruck, using musicians, musicians and, and athletes. If I saw like, you know, if I saw Mookie Betts or Tom Brady, or I'm a big hockey fan. So if I saw Zidane Chara, who's the captain of the Boston Bruins, I love the Bruins. Uh, I would be starstruck by those guys, but less so about actors. Right, hang on, I've got to ask you, um, because I don't want to keep you all night or all day. Um, mm -hmm. Commit 
52. I'm fascinated about it. Tell people what Commit 52 is about. Oh, thanks for bringing that up. Commit 52 is a website that my partner and I, my fiance, put together. It's uh, the word commit and the numbers 52.com. Um, it is a anti-racism commitment website where, you know, here in the U.S., the summer was filled with protests and yeah. so many people were impassioned about. Yeah. And here too. And here yeah. too. I just knew that it was going to slow down. We, we, you know, we were, we were having protests every day and the country was on fire. And, but I knew because it was an election year and Trump is the president that, and we weren't living in a global pandemic, that another news story was going to take over the news cycle. And the no. news cycle stops for no one. And I knew this was going to slow down and people's activism was going to wane. So how do we keep it up? How do we keep doing this and not just do it for a month and go, all right, I'm kind of done with that. What's new? So we did this web, we created this website with all of these um, action items, all of these podcasts to listen to and books to read and black businesses to support and documentaries to watch and just ways to continue to educate as white people um, how we have been a part, we've been socialized in a racist society. And it has to be, you have to, um, Resma Menekin, who's this incredible um, therapist and, and thought leader, out of Minneapolis, he wrote a book called My Grandmother's Hands, and it's about racialized trauma. And he said for white people, white people, it has to be, it's not part of their culture to fight this fight. You have to put it into like your bones. You have to think about it every week. It has to be part of your life or it will not change. So that takes practice. It hasn't been part of my life until the last year. Um, it was something, I thought I was one of the good white people because I didn't, where I had identified racists, racists with like the 60s in the US South and dogs and hoses and beatings. I was like, well, I don't wear a hood. I'm a good white person. But that's not the whole story. That's not the whole story. You have to actively try to break it um, to really participate. So Commit 52 is a website that we put together so people can go to this website and find different resources to try to do that work. What kind of response have you had? Pretty, only great. Only great. Um, I, I wish I had more. Uh, I wish I had, you know, thousands of people signing up to it. We have a couple hundred at the moment. So I've had trouble reaching a wider audience. And so I really, Rob, I appreciate you bringing it up because it's something I really love to talk about. Get the word I was out. When I was fascinated when I was reading about it t today. Good, good on you, mate. Good on you. Yeah. Um, I've, got, I've got a couple more. Um, I loved Anthony Bourdain. Oh, man, yeah. Yeah. You know what? What? what I, 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 I was one of obviously was so so bitterly upset when 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 he took his own life. But you know what? Having watched everything he's ever done, I went back and rewatched it. And do you know what? The man's a, the man is a genius. Was a genius. What a what a what a person. People don't realize what a. I hope people tuck into him. I know he was a massive star, but people who maybe haven't seen him revisit him or, or discover him. What a guy! How what quickly guy. were you? How quickly were you able to get back and rewatch? Re um, well, like, it depends on so much on networks. There's so much on YouTube. There's so much. I mean, I, the thing I'm not saying I was in early as a Bourdain fan, but I, I pretty what pretty much was. I, uh, I got Kitchen Confidential quite early on, oh, um, and and it, it's just as a as a as a television person as as a, a, an actor yourself. I mean, he had it. He, he, you know, not just the, the subject matter, the way he talked. The, he could talk to anybody. You know, that great one yeah. when he was with a bar, and then he's, you know, he will talk to, to, to the, you know, to when he's in Beirut, for example. I mean, the, the stuff's amazing. Yeah, I, I asked how quickly he went back to watching him because after he he died, I, my fiance and I, we watched everything of his, and we were obsessed with him. We still haven't gone back. I've watched a couple of clips on YouTube, but we still haven't gone back to rewatch uh, Parts Unknown or The Layover or Kinch Confidential Cook Brilliant. Tour. Because we're too, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to watch. I'm afraid to like. Don't be afraid, honestly. Don't be afraid. Okay. You'll, you'll, you'll go. I was, I know, I know exactly what you mean. I was like that. No, go and do it. Great. It, warmth still comes. You know? Yeah, he's you know he's he was magic. He was magic. I think it had a lot to do with his upbringing. I think it had a lot to do with hitting every step up on the way. About and also being a heroin addict in the '70s and having to fight through addiction. And you know when you hit every step on the way, you, you're able to have a 
fuller view of what it means to be a human being. And uh, his perspective was just so welcomed. I just, I, 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 there's so much television that I'm so snotty about. And I'll go, well, I don't know about this. I don't know about this episode. Da, da, da. Every, every Anthony Bourdain moment, I just like treasured. And so it's still, it's still hard to think about. I think he died two years ago, two Julys ago, June or July. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I still miss him. I, one of the greats, one of, one of the greats. We're not going to end on, on it's not a down, it's, it's lovely to talk about him. Um, do you know what's coming up for you? <clears throat> Have you got any, is there any plan written down? Is there any film? Is there any play that we can talk? Having said, I've got to pick a bone with you because you absolutely shattered every father in the world by giving your father a picture of Morgan Fairchild and you. It was a big but night for him. Fox. She, um, she, she played, I was in the tour of the, the touring production of The Graduate, which originated wow. in London. Um, with Matthew Reese. Matthew Reese was the original Benjamin to Kathleen Turner, Mrs. Wow. Robinson, moved to Broadway and then they had a national tour. And so when I played Benjamin, Morgan Fairchild was my Mrs. Robinson. And we did that show for six months together and she was lovely, but that, yeah, that made my dad's life getting that picture with her. Um, next, next up for me is a, is a the second season of an Apple series that I worked on that came out last year um, called For All Mankind, which is this reinvented uh, uh, space race story as if the Russians got to the moon first. So what, what implications, um, what, would, what would happen next for the US and for the, the globe really? Because um, the space race was so important to American culture in the 50s and 60s. Um, so if the Russians got there first, all hell breaks loose. So the second season finished shooting uh, recently, I think it'll come out in, later in this fall, early winter. So you can keep your eyes peeled for that. Great. Hey, do you know what? Thanks. Oh, Rob. Thank you. Lovely talk. My great pleasure. Hey, and do you know? What? Do you know what as well? The leaf blow is gone. <laughs> He's moved on to another pile of leaves. There's more leaves to blow, Rob. There's more leaves to blow in this town. So he's blowing them everywhere. Hey, do you know what? I'm going to follow. We'll all be following your career with great interest. And hopefully, let's do this again soon. Would love to. Anytime. I really appreciate your thoughtful questions. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. Take care, Nate. All the best to you. All right. Take care, man. See you, Rob. Bye-bye. Later.